from Long Distance 2 is a poem that's specific to the Cambridge Poetry Collection. Um, so if you're studying any other type of thing to do with Tony Harrison and Long Distance, just make sure that you've got the right one for the right course and that kind of thing. Because that word from just means it's it's a selection, uh, sort of like a section of a, a longer poem called Long Distance 2. Um, and he, he also, I think, had Long Distance and Long Distance 2. So there's a lot. I've not actually read the all of them. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of go back and read them. Uh, so yeah, this one is just for the Cambridge um, poetry anthology. So we'll jump into it. There's a really interesting opening to this section. Though my mother was already two years dead, da dad kept her slippers warming by the gas. So you want to think about that. It's a very uh, clear image. It's a domestic image to do with the house. It's um, the speaker's parents it's a memory, a reflection. So you might want to just write a few of your own ideas down about that opening to this poem or to this section of the poem. There's a few bits of vocabulary here as well. A few, probably most of them uh, are quite clear because he uses very simplistic kind of um, domestic language, so easy to understand everyday speech. So it shouldn't really be that difficult for you to understand, but there are a few words um, in the vocabulary as well for you. So yeah, read through the poem, um, read it aloud to yourself if you can, and try to highlight or underline any of the key images in the poem. So the things that sort of pop into your head as an image as you go through and try and figure out what's going on in those first two lines, because it, it is a sort of bit of a shocking um, start. It's what we call in medias res. So um, like I say, it's, it's difficult to analyze it as that because it's from a longer poem, but the section of the poem that you guys have here, you're getting just plunged straight into the idea that the speaker's mother has died, died two years ago, but the father keeps this kind of ritual going that he always did when she was alive. And you might think about why does she do that? Or why does he do that? And uh, what does that kind of show about them and their relationship and also the speaker and his relationship to his parents? So yeah, really interesting, touching, poignant poem. I'll just be quiet for a second and then you can read it aloud to yourself when you're ready, come back to the class. So as a summary uh, of this one, I'll just kind of put it big on the, on the board. Um, the idea is that, you know, the father performs these rituals that he performed when the mother was still alive. Uh, he also has this kind of control over his life. You can't just drop in, which means you can't just, you know, turn up, open the door, walk into the house. You have to phone, you have to, um, you know, give him time to prepare his space. He would delay seeing you for an hour because he needed to clear away her things to make it look like he lived there alone. So when no one's around, he still has all her things everywhere. And when, um, you know, when people come around, he realizes that it seems a bit mad or a bit strange. So he puts everything that he normally has out, he'll hide, even for his son in this case, um, you know, who's obviously part of this family as well. And the son says, as if his still raw love was such a crime. So he loves his wife so much, even two years after she's died, that he still wants to be surrounded by her things. Very touching, I think, really beautiful. Um, you might reflect on your own family relationships or any experiences that you have of um, people maybe who've passed away and how the partner of that person has coped with grief. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's very, very touching kind of portrayal of love and grief, I think, in this poem. The speaker says that his disbelief is kind of a blight. So it's almost like the, the speaker, the son, has, it doesn't quite have the same attitude to grief and doesn't have that kind of, you know, urge to just keep the same routine. And so that actually is a threat to the father because it's, it's breaking up his his world that he's tried so hard to sort of preserve as it was. So it's almost like he feels like, you know, he'll hear her key scrape in the lock and she'll just come come 
home and so she's just been out to to buy tea get the tea that might mean a cup of tea but also um i think tony harrow i can't quite remember but i think he's a leeds poet and um in leeds or kind of in the north uh, around yorkshire i'm actually filming this in leeds at the moment because i'm on a a work trip um but yeah that this kind of area we call tea uh supper dinner you know the same thing so you, you, your tea is kind of like your dinner as well um so the speaker says that he be like, believes that life ends with death that's all you've not gone shopping even though i believe this i still have to put your name he's now speaking to his own mum into my new black leather phone book and the disconnected number I still call. So there's a huge turning point at the end of this poem uh, where it goes from the dad seeming like he's a bit mad and the speaker seeming like, you know, he's the son, he's more rational, he's more kind of got a normal reaction to grief to actually he's, he's doing something similar to what the dad's doing. Maybe the dad's way of coping is a bit more extreme because he keeps the house exactly how it was when she was alive. But the speaker still puts his mother's name who's died into his new phone book and still calls her phone number even though she's dead, you know, hoping that she might be there. So it's really like emotional, I think, and beautiful and touching um, that the speaker admits that he too has these kinds of rituals that he refuses to let go of, he still has this kind of hope that maybe the mother is around somewhere, even though it's obviously illogical. So a very sad poem, but beautiful and uh, very complex, even though it's so simplistic and so kind of easy to access and understand. Um, so yeah, you can have a look a little bit more into the speaker and voice and the details of it there. I've kind of gone through that, so I'll skip that one. But yeah, feel free to pause, look through. We'll go to the scribbly.com page and download this as well as a document for you to read through. We'll jump into the language. It's a lot of interesting use of language here. On the surface, it seems like just normal everyday conversation. But actually, if you look through it in a more analytical way, you'll notice there's a lot of devices being used. Um, so yeah, direct address, you couldn't drop in, you had to phone. It's kind of like, you know, one couldn't drop in, a person couldn't drop in. So it creates a kind of conversational tone to the poem that is echoed in the simplistic language of the poem as well. I found this um, simile quite, quite touching, you know, my father had to hide, hide his love and his rituals and his grief as if his still raw love was such a crime. This is what we call monosyllabic lexis, as though his still raw love were such a crime. Very simple, single syllable words. This phrase still raw love um, is very evocative, I think, of the, the feeling. Like you might go into that adjective raw and think a bit more deeply about what does that mean? Like raw love, what is raw? How does raw feel, what's the kind of connotations of raw, because there's quite a lot of different analyses you can do of that word. So yeah, as I've said before, d domestic setting, um, you know, signaled by a range of visual images, which you should go through and highlight in the poem or underline them. My favourite thing I think about this poem or this section of the poem is the antithesis, the, the flip at the end that twists everything on its head and changes our understanding of the situation. So the, the fact that he's still illogically calling her number, um, it creates a bathos, an anti-climax, because we realize the speaker actually is still placed in the same state as his father. They're all struggling, uh, even two years after she's died, to move on from the, the grief and the feeling of loss. So some interesting um, structural elements as well that you can look through. The main thing is that it's very regular and I think that um, evokes a sense of control that's needed in order to cope with certain situations, especially when people feel like they're placed into a moment of stress where something random happens that they really have no control over. 
their urge really is to kind of regulate their life, set routines, create patterns that feel comforting. Um, so yeah, the, the father in particular seems to have these, these rituals, these patterns that he's kind of uh, stuck on in order to, to cope with the grief. It's also an elegy. So make sure you know what elegies are, how they work. They're, they're poems that um, commemorate the dead in some way. So from the speaker's point of view, this is an elegy to his mother. It's also a, another way of honoring um, his mother. Yeah, so Tony Harrison does write plays as well as poems. Um, I've not actually seen any of his plays, but I do really love his poems. He's a very interesting uh, poet, very good modern poet. And um, yeah, he sees even his plays as an expression of poetry. So he thinks of himself as poetic to start with, which is, is quite nice, I think. So a couple of attitudes or beliefs, kind of opinions and messages in the poem. Um, that bereavement, when you've lost someone you love uh, who's died, that's a very complex and difficult situation that people re uh, react to in completely random ways. And a lot of it is nonsensical or illogical. So it, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense what people do in response to grief, but it's how they cope and it's how they, how they kind of um, process the intense emotions. Uh, there's also this kind of beautiful thing, I think, about grief, because it's such a sad emotion. But um, I remember, I mean, it depends on your perspective on animals, because uh, some people might think this is like extreme. But I used to run a dog rescue and I had, uh, I saved this kind of very old, very sick dog, as well, as well as lots of other dogs. And I adopted him. And I looked after him for four years, and then he died. And when he died, I just remember feeling completely lost. And I think I, I was sort of manically cleaning my house for a week. Like I was obsessively scrubbing my kitchen and sweeping my floors way more than it needed to be cleaned just because I kind of wanted to keep busy and I wanted, I, I couldn't sit still because sitting still made me kind of think about him and made me really sad. And, you know, I kind of wasn't ready to let go of him. So I was just like, doing really strange stuff. People came around to my house and I'd be cleaning, you know, really late at night or something. And, um, yeah, I don't normally do that kind of behavior, but it was a way of processing, uh, grief. So yeah, if you've had significant, you know, grief and bereavement in your life, you might think about how you've, um, coped with that yourself as well. So it's kind of like, okay, that it's illogical. It's okay that their behavior doesn't make sense and that it's, it's irrational because it's it's more about the processing of an emotion and the respect that and love that they had for the person who died than it is for the act making sense itself. Um, so yeah, there's this sense that you know there's there's a lot of love and understanding even between the father and the son who have a slight disconnection. The father obviously is keeping parts of his life from the son. Um, but they have a respect and a love for each other that, you know, they're bonded over their love for the mother as well, um, or the wife. Uh, yeah, the, the line, I believe life ends with death and that is all is really interesting Volta because it just, it, it sort of shows that the speaker is more practical or realistic about it. Um, more atheistic as well, like very, maybe the, the father is also atheistic, but yeah, there's this, this atheistic attitude. There's no spirituality. It's kind of an anti-spiritual statement, but then that's really undermined, um, by the last, you know, image of the poem where he's calling a phone number that doesn't exist, hoping his mum will pick up maybe as a ghost or something. Uh, so yeah, it's really interesting that very certain sure of himself tone that is then undermined at the end. So tasks to do, um, you can pick two of these themes and just explore them a little bit more, make mind maps on them, find quotes that relate to them and analyze those quotes. You can also try these exercises here, which will help you open up the poem in more detail and also think more technically about the effects of the poem. And then when you're ready, um, you can try one or two of these essay questions, either by planning or by writing the full essay. Um, so yeah, this is, I think, an amazing poem, really beautiful, very touching, and hopefully you, 
hopefully you're not feeling too sad about it. <laughs> um, but hopefully you're also like, you know, quite impressed by by the maturity of this poem, I think, and the complexity of it, because it's a, a really, really good one. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed the lesson and I'll see you guys soon. Oh, also go to scribbly.com if you need any more stuff. I forgot to say that. Normally I say that, but <laughs> yeah, we have full courses on there, downloadable documents, essay writing support, even tuition if you need one-to-one -one tuition with me or another tutor. So lots of stuff on there to do as well. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening and I'll see you guys soon.